Wow, what a great room. Um, speaker, Kevin, great to be here with you. First of all, to be doing this at South by Southwest, I think, is, is it's important. This is, this is a, a venue and event every year that I think is associated with thought leadership and trends that are both important socially, uh, from a business community perspective. And I think in that sense, we really have, have kind of got it all going on here. Um, apologies, I apparently missed the memo about the turquoise blue sport coat today, guys. <laughs> Um, so, Tim, I specifically told <laughs> Kevin last night that I was wearing this unusually blue sport coat. Don't wear something like it. What? I showed up this morning. He didn't get the memo. Yeah, no, he didn't. And, and by the way, I might be the only guy at a cannabis event wearing a tie, so um, apologies on that, too. So, look, we don't have a lot of time. Um, in fact, I think what we're going to try to do is definitely save some time in the end for Q&A. Um, I hope also because we, we can see questions coming through that we're going to incorporate the wide variety of questions that I think this issue frankly encompasses and that I think that these two speakers can really get to the bottom of, but, but just know that that's part of our format. Um, and so, you know, to, to dive in, Kevin, let, let's quickly, for, for everyone who doesn't follow the cannabis industry as, as deeply as, as we all do, and that could be from a social and economic um, and, and otherwise perspective. Give us some background uh, on Acreage, uh, the company you founded, and, and a little bit about the, you know, the, the way you arrived in the sector yourself. Sure. Back in 2011, I was introduced to the cannabis space. Uh, I, like many at that time, was quite skeptical. I uh, was not a believer in cannabis, only to the extent that I didn't have a previous relationship with the plant. Um, I was asked to participate in the state of Maine, which was the first state east of the Mississippi uh, to adhere to a, uh, a medical cannabis program. Um, from there, uh, ultimately made my first investment after learning about the medicinal value of the plant from a number of doctors who believed that this could be the silver bullet for the future. So it was the combination of economics as well as the medicinal value that had me make the first investment in 2011, uh, had made subsequent investments um, after that date to where in 2015, we rolled all those investments into an investment company and ultimately aggregated all of the assets into a holding company which we had taken public last year on the Canadian Stock Exchange. By the way, that sounds like an incredibly, uh, with all the, the, the legal kind of dynamics at work here, um, the complications of the legal environment you're operating, just uh, sum that up. How, how, how extraordinary of a task was it putting those companies together and navigating the legal quagmire? Well, we look at each state as its own individual country. Right. And we understand that state as best we can, and then it's our goal to maximize our footprint in every particular state that we're in. So we believe that being vertically integrated is the best way in which to approach this business yeah. where we grow, process, and dispense in every state. So today we're in 19 states, the largest in the U.S., and we'd like to continue with that pole position going forward. And, and talk about, again, let's, we're hitting, this is such a big topic socially. Um, and, and, and I would argue, you know, it's an industry, by the way, that I've been investing in for three or four years, and I'm someone that invests in new asset classes. I come, come by this by someone that invested in China back in the, in the early 90s, and Russia in the late 90s, and Brazil. But talk about this as a transformational moment in our country's history, um, and also, frankly, the product itself, and, and how you feel, and the passion you feel, and I think Acreage feels, about getting the product in the hands of people that need it. Sure. I think when getting involved in 2011-12, very few people in this country believed in uh, the cannabis space. Today, fast forward, 2019, the statistics are staggering. The, the amazing growth over that period of time where 95% of this country believes in the medicinal value and, and believe it should be available, um, and 66% believe it should be available for adult use. All of that said, we are very passionate about advocating for, for veterans with children with epilepsy. And that's really what drives us every day to create a very, very large organization. I often say the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And you better have a lot of money to give if you want to give back. And so that's why we're certainly proud of the accomplishments. Um, but we're going to use that uh, multi-billion dollar balance sheet to implement programs for veterans, um, push forward on social justice, and 
be not only the industry leader in economics, but also the industry leader in social. Yeah, I think you know th those are the part of the reasons why, frankly, uh, cannabis as a sector and as an industry has been one of these um, called bipartisan issues, and it's one of the reasons why I think the legislation is is changing dramatically in this country. And, and uh, so, the, the gentleman to my right, um, it brings up that that moment, uh, Speaker, where there are these moments where we all have them in our lives professionally, whether it's a sports moment, whether it's a it's a it's a it's a cultural moment. But but as it relates to certainly someone that's been in the sector for a long time, there's those moments when you 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 hear of an event and you remember where you were when. And when I heard that Speaker Boehner was joining the board of Acreage, I mean, I, you know, look, I'm just telling you, um, because if, if people knew one thing about Speaker Boehner was that he was a, a passionate man who worked hard for this country for a long time, they also knew that he was a man that at least seemed like he espoused some very conservative values that might not be consistent with this legislative moment in time. Um, and so I, I want to speak to that speaker, and I want to talk then, Kevin, about the strategy of finding uh, leaders like Speaker Boehner and Brian Mulroney and, 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 and Bill Weld, governor, former governor of Massachusetts, to be on your team. But, Speaker, talk about what was the catalyst for you? What made you come on board here? I really had never thought much about it, but over the oh, last five, six, seven years, uh, I kind of found myself uh, looking at this issue differently than I used to. Part of it was uh, uh, evidence you run into people who would talk about it, uh, friends uh, that, that I didn't know used the product, but used the product. That's so why I, I was beginning to change a lot, like a lot of Americans were, in terms of how they viewed. There's a lot of folks, by the way, that thought there was a lot of product being used down on the hill at one point, um, based upon how things were going, but I, I digress. Um, <laughs> sorry, so, uh, anybody's out there. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, I was, my thought process was moving a little bit, but uh, I really hadn't done any, any real research. And uh, I met Kevin, and uh, Kevin started to talk to me, and I thought, you know, uh, I'm probably not going to do this, but I'd like to learn more about it. And, uh, and uh, Kevin introduced me to some people, a veteran, Navy SEAL, 20 years, retired, more concussions than you can imagine. Uh, doctors want to give him opioids, opioids, and he said, listen, I got a wife and four kids, I want to be a father and a husband and a, to, to my family. And he thought, I don't want to use this stuff. And so he just lived with it. And uh, he was introduced to, to cannabis, and uh, his headaches went away. I mean, real relief for these guys. Uh, veterans with PTSD. So I started doing all this research and talking to some of my friends, and I thought, you know what? I think I'm going to lend my voice uh, to this debate. And uh, yes, it was uh, quite a shock to a lot of people. Uh, clearly, all of my former colleagues in the Congress. Well, that, that's one of the questions that's popping up here, like in red, over and over again. What were your colleagues saying about this? Uh, I don't well, they all and do you, And do you care? Well, they all tease me about it, but it doesn't matter. Uh, but the people who come up to me every single day for the last year <clears throat> has shocked me. Right. Uh, I don't know, gentlemen. 85 years old, pulling bags off of a conveyor at, at the airport at midnight one night, and he came over to me and said, Congressman, thanks for your position on cannabis. He said, I've got arthritis so bad I can't hardly move. Yeah. But uh, with cannabis, it allows me to function. And uh, every day there are these anecdotal stories that, that you hear. So the American people uh, clearly are changing their views of this product. And, uh, and as they do, this industry is going to grow, frankly, exponentially yeah. over the next 10 or 20 years. It's actually very exciting. Well, I, I commend you for, you know, I think you've, you've acknowledged that you, you had a shift in view on this. And, and that's, I think, frankly, what we want from our leaders is to be thoughtful um, and to be reflective upon, first of all, change that happens. Um, I, I'd also be remiss, because it seems to be popping up all over here in red, um, wh what's your relationship with the product? If, and you can answer that question any way you want. I've never used the product. Okay. I smoke cigarettes, I drink red wine, I have a little bourbon, <laughs> uh, but... Uh, a little bourbon. I am, a little picky. A little bourbon. But uh, uh, I've not used the product. Right. Not to say I'll never use it, but I haven't used it yet. No, I, and I think, frankly, the, the demographic and the consumption dynamics that are going on in cannabis mean that. Uh, for companies like Acreage, folks, really, 
that is the target market. It's, it's, the, it's the crossover folks or it's the folks that really are going to be consuming for the first time and, and frankly, uh, the consistency, the quality, the integrity, um, the social values behind it, I think, are, are, are critical. Well, I'll give you an example. You know, I, I take Advil PM most every night. Right. It helps me sleep. I don't want to take Advil PM every night. Right. But at some point, there's going to be, uh, I think, a cannabis product uh, that will help me there sleep. There is right now. Uh, that what? <laughs> Great show of hands. Who, who's getting a little assistance sleeping oh, yeah. at night? All right. No, I mean, but that, that's the reality. And if people are walking into Walgreens or CVS or some kind of an OTC drug environment, 80% of, of what they're going to the counter with uh, are things that are symptoms or treatments or dynamics that, that cannabis can, can cure. And so, so, Kevin, um, you get Senator, excuse me, you get Speaker Boehner, um, you have the dynamic where you've got some major political heavyweights on this board. Talk about that strategy, um, because clearly Acreage, uh, it seems to me, is, is a political think tank in addition to being the leading company in the United States. Well, you had mentioned earlier that you know exactly where you were at a point in time when an event occurred. Um, I can tell you exactly where I was um, when Jeff Sessions rescinded the Cole memo, I was actually taking anti-nausea medication, uh, thinking, oh gosh, after all these years, you know, we've come to this. Now, I'll also say that um, the speaker joined us shortly after that moment, and to me, I believe it was a seminal change in the, in frankly, our trajectory. Yeah. But we see this business as really the cross-section between regulatory and commerce. And whether it's uh, Speaker Boehner, Governor Weld, Prime Minister Moroni, coupled with Larissa Herta, she was the chairperson for Time Warner, uh, Bill Von Fossen, chairman of Blue Cross Blue Shield, and Doug Main, who was the past uh, CFO of IBM. We have people that are thinking about business, People that are thinking about the regulatory landscape marry those together, and we believe it's our obligation to advocate for the plant itself. You, know, you don't have to use the plant to understand the medicinal benefits of it. And all we're looking for is to have the federal government pass the States Act, which gives everyone a choice to either use it or not. And as I stated earlier in a conversation, Let's just assume that it's all anecdotal stories and it has no medicinal value. If someone can utilize this plant and substitute it for opiates, we're going to have a lot less deaths per day than 130 today. No, and we, in fact, we've seen anecdotally the countries that actually have medical programs, um, the healthcare costs are, are down anywhere from 15 to 20 percent, just on some small bit of integrative medicine in, in, where you're essentially uh, using cannabis along even with opioids. So, Speaker Boehner, um, we've, you're, you're near your one-year anniversary here at the helm. Um, what, what's caught you uh, as being the most surprising you know, dynamic here Really, as it then, because I want to get into Washington and talk about the hypocrisy of, of a Schedule One drug, uh, yet seems to be legal in 33 states. It, you know, it doesn't doesn't seem to add up. Well, as I mentioned before, uh, over this last year, I've just been shocked by the number of people I talk to every single day uh, that have an interest uh, in this plant or an interest in what uh, Washington is doing or not doing. Uh, haven't been around uh, politics for 35 years. I think I understand voters. Uh, when you. you see 33 states uh, approve the use of cannabis in some form, uh, it tells me that the American people are for this. And, uh, and, and members of Congress, other elected officials, uh, pretty smart folks, you know, when they find out that people are for this, guess what? They begin to change uh, their opinion as well. And so while uh, Washington, uh, has just been in the way. 33 states have done this under the 10th Amendment. States can do uh, whatever they want to do as long as it doesn't violate the Constitution and as long as they're not bigfooted by Washington. So 33 states have done this. And it's not that Washington is purposefully, <clears throat> purposefully getting in the way. It's just that they have been in the way and they're not getting the hell out of the way. And so, uh, you know, when it comes to banking, you know, a lot of uh, uh, 
these operations can't take their money to a bank. So you've just got carloads and safe yeah. full of cash. Not very safe. Absolutely <laughs> silly. Uh, and you've got uh, IRS regulations uh, that are onerous on people who produce uh, cannabis uh, because it's a Schedule One narcotic. And so uh, the federal government just needs to get out of the way. Now, whether it's the state tax, uh, whether the FDA decides we're going to reschedule uh, cannabis to uh, Schedule Three or Four, or, or just deschedule it altogether, uh, there are a number of things that could happen. But right now, the States Act uh, is where I think most of the momentum is, and it says the federal legislation in Congress. It says that if the state has decided uh, that they want to make cannabis legal, the federal government recognizes that it's legal in that state. Right. Uh, that uh, would be a giant step in the right direction. Kevin, talk about, again, other elements of the States Act here that you think will be a game changer. I think you're out there on the record saying that you, you think 2019, this legislation is happening. Um, and it may not mean full uh, decriminalization on a federal level, may not essentially lose the Schedule One on a federal level, but it will allow companies to bank. It will allow a little bit more uh, rational thinking as it relates to the retail footprint of companies that are actually selling it and the taxation and allow these people to survive. By the way, um, to fend off the illicit market, which it's not about who's a good guy or who's a bad guy. There's what's legal and there's what's not. Uh, and frankly, the way it's set up right now, the legal businesses aren't terribly well incented to, to, to be there because the tax structure is so onerous. So talk about this as a catalyst in 2019 and what it means for your company. Well, with the passage of the States Act, we believe that we would get, as uh, Speaker Boehner had mentioned, um, a better tax code in which to operate. Right. We've provided hundreds of careers and hundreds of jobs for people that are passionate about this business that want to help people help themselves. Wouldn't it be nice to have a normalized tax code where we can pay these people better and where we can have a more profitable business to give back more on social issues. So I think it's the combination of a fair tax code and the privilege of listing our company on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. Today, we're not welcome here in the US as one of the largest providers of cannabis in the US. What do those exchanges say to you? Because again, for, for the market's perspective, credibility is being on one of those exchanges, sure. with all due respect to our Canadian friends, who, who clearly have been the home away from home for companies like yours. And, and yet, you know, this is the United States. These are the biggest capital markets in the world, yet somehow sure. we're not allowed to access them. Well, the Canadians are. And you have some thought leaders and business leaders in Canada, such as Canopy and others, that are now on the New York Stock Exchange on the NASDAQ. So they welcome the Canadians and basically to basically repatriate all of that money back to their country. I think it's time that we change our view so we can be on an equal footing. I commend the Canadians for being very aggressive and in many respects the first G7 country to recognize that this has a place in society. And just to add on, because it's a Schedule One narcotic, Banks will not deal with you. Uh, these exchanges will not list you. Uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it's just antiquated. And uh, it, it's not that it was done on purpose. Uh, the, the world is changing, and the federal government hasn't caught up. Yeah, it, it, it certainly does seem you know, antithetical to the United States, which is the home of innovation. Uh, it's certainly been a leader in terms of social values, I'd like to believe, globally, to, to really be playing second fiddle here. But, you know, the people are, are, are clearly speaking, and legislatively, we see it happening. So let's, let's dive into a little bit deeper into some of the, uh, the sub-verticals within the government or the regulatory bodies, Speaker. Talk about the FDA. Uh, friend or foe, first of all? Uh, I would, I don't know. Right. Well, they, I don't know how much time, if any, uh, that they've spent dealing with this. Uh, I thought uh, last year when, uh, when Jeff Sessions came out and said, I'm going to tear up the coal letter and we're going to enforce the law, I started laughing. Nerf was all nervous. I said, this is the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> uh, because yes, he was. it's going to push Congress off their dead asses and do something. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, I mean, 
And I, I might add, I was right. Right. Uh, because all of a sudden there was action going on in the Congress. Uh, listen, I think there's a really good chance that the States Act becomes law uh, either later this year or early next year. You can just see the momentum uh, moving. Uh, it's likely to happen. Uh, and uh, frankly, uh, the sooner the better. Kevin, have we taken a step back with the FDA with the resignation of Scott Gottlieb? Or in fact, we've got a new appointee who may be more CBD friendly. You know, talk about this. Um, talk about this, then drop it into the context of your business plan um, as a company that's building a, fit, a footprint nationally. And frankly, hemp or CBD derived from hemp is now federally legal, and it allows you to be in places to, to plant that flag right now. It's not legal until the FDA issues regulations. The FDA came out last week and said, well, we've had six months to do these regulations, but we can't quite get our arms around this. Right. We're not going to have the regulations for a while. They're not equipped at this point to deal with this. And so who knows how long it's going to take the FDA uh, to get their act together. And in the meantime, they went out and locked a few people up uh, who were selling uh, hemp-based CBD, right. uh, I guess, to flex their muscles. It's not going to, they're kidding themselves. Well, yeah, I mean, and to be clear, you could drive hemp around in 18 wheelers from state to state right now, but if you want to create products and put them into foods and, 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 and other associated you know, consumer uses, it's illegal. So, mm -hmm. Kevin, how, how do you navigate this? But isn't this an opportunity? It seems to me this is an opportunity, whether you're actually uh, going to get on the FDA's bad side or, or, or not necessarily even putting those products on shelves yet. You are allowed to be building this business right now, no? We are. And I think we, uh, in going back in time, one of the main reasons why we had been attracted to the business is because the, it was the, the arbitrage or the, the difference between perceived risk and actual risk. Mm -hmm. And my view was at the time, I'd be willing to risk maybe several million dollars on an investment because the people around this business, such as the law firm that helped us in Maine and the General Assembly of that state, they had much more to lose than I think I did or my group of uh, investors did. Right. So really what we're striving for today, whether it's the FDA on CBD or whether it's banking in the THC market, all we want is clarity. We want to have it where it's black, it's white, and these are the lanes that you have to be in, right. and we can abide by that. Every state in the U.S. has a different program. We have to adjust and, and, and morph our business plan to be a part of that. But again, you know, that's really, I think, the concern that I have. And yes, in this time of uncertainty, we'll continue to build our business and be ready for that time when the FDA, FDA says, these are the rules, let's go. So, so Speaker, and, and Kevin, but Speaker, uh, you've now created the, the National Cannabis Roundtable. Uh, Kevin, you're part of this as well. What, what's, the, what's the raison d'etre? What, what is your mission statement? What are you trying to do? Uh, at this point, we're probably eight to 10 companies uh, who are big players in the industry. Uh, who want uh, Congress and the administration to act. Uh, this is not some uh, coalition of people sitting around talking to each other. Uh, this is about delivering results. And uh, it's the States Act. It's fixing the banking problem, if, uh, if we can do that first. Fixing the IRS problem. Uh, at some point, it may have involved uh, dealing with the FDA in ter terms of the regulatory system. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it's a serious effort to change the federal regulations and laws. In terms of, again, back to DC, and maybe to address some of the social issues that people are concerned about, and, and that includes criminal justice, and includes the influence of big tobacco, big pharma. Um, what do you see as the role that those industries, I'd love to hear an honest assessment of the history of those industries and how they've affected cannabis, cannabis legalization, um, and what you know in, in terms of, um, are they the big bad wolves out there? Um, should they be trusted? Um, because the, the, the social view, and certainly I, I don't get the sense that they are. Well, somebody 100 years ago decided that cannabis uh, ought to be a Schedule I narcotic. Uh, Who and, was that? And uh, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know who the players were, but somebody decided this was bad stuff. And, and uh, pardon me? All right. Thank you. 
Uh, but uh, uh, I, everything that happens in Washington has somebody, some power behind it. And uh, some people have uh, uh, good reasons behind being around positions, and some people are rather nefarious. So I don't know how this became law, but w once something becomes law in the U.S., uh, you'd be shocked at how hard it is to change the law. The forces of the status quo are, frankly, immense. Right. And so it really takes what the American people are doing, changing their views, speaking out, uh, that's getting Congress to actually move uh, on this. Uh, but uh, that, looking down the road, uh, big farmers always looking for new markets. Uh, I was on the board of Reynolds American before we sold it to British American Tobacco. You know, cigarette sales dropped 3 to 4% a year. Beer sales are down. Alcohol sales are down. These industries are looking for a way uh, to, to be able to, to, to grow their businesses again. And so uh, the, all these people are kind of hovering around us. Uh, I, I have people talking to me all the time, talking, they're talking to Kevin a lot more than me, actually, uh, waiting uh, for this to become a, a, a legal product. Is that, is that really what it comes down to? Because it seems to me uh, they're either playing defense uh, and running scared, or they, they could have been playing offense. But you know, the irony of Big Pharma is that they're waiting for, for it to be fully federal, but let's be clear, what's going on uh, with reputationally with the Big Pharma companies as it relates to opioids and other things that are tearing up our country, um, they don't seem to care. So uh, how do you reconcile that? I don't. Yeah. There's no way to reconcile it. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, big pharma, uh, then you've got what I'll call little pharma. Okay. Uh, little pharma, you know, these guys, these are the opioid producers and, uh, and other some of, some of them going out of business as we speak. <clears throat> exactly. And if you look at the number of lawsuits that are out there, there's no way they can defend themselves right. uh, with the lawsuits that are coming from, from every nook and cranny of the country. Kevin, anything to add just on, on what you're seeing? Because you have to be getting approached on a daily basis, as the speaker talked sure. about, by these industries. What, what, what can you tell I, I would I would add to uh, John's comments that um, it's a little bit of both offense and defense. Tobacco companies have plenty of cash to redeploy. Alcohol sales are down, so they need to find another lane in which to, to be involved. Um, but it's not only um, big pharma big tobacco or big alcohol, you've got a whole nother wellness component to this business. So, you know. Yeah, I mean, some, how about L'Oreal? How about yeah, you know, every major? Co Coca-Cola, Coca -Cola, how Procter about, and Gamble? You know, uh, every consumer uh, product manufacturer out there, we're, we've been approached um, over and over again um, given our capabilities through the form factory to really produce the first um, FDA compliant products in the marketplace today. And it's not only brands from other states that would like to be in 19 states, um, but it's other companies that are making dog foods, other companies that are making right. cosmetics. And so you're, you're seeing this. Do you have a dog? <laughs> I I'm want just, one. Okay. But, uh, just want to know if if, uh, if, the, if Fido <laughs> at the Murphy House is getting some CBD but Tim, supplements. But Tim, but here's um, the issue. Because it's a Schedule One narcotic, uh, most of these other big players in the, in the food, drug, alcohol industry, uh, tobacco, are federally regulated. Yeah. Uh, and this is a Schedule One narcotic that's illegal. So they, they can't really, they can't get into the business. They can't get into the market uh, uh, today uh, without taking a big risk uh, from their regulators. You know, uh, I'm sure the FDA is not going to, would not look kindly on, uh, on some big pharma company uh, jumping into, into this industry. Uh, but once, it, once it, if the States Act passes, once this becomes somewhat legal, uh, you're going to see a flood of, uh, of big players coming in, into this industry. Yeah, and that's interesting. And, and from, from my perspective as a markets guy and just understanding what, what makes regulators happy, I think, um, big tobacco and big pharma on some level should be welcomed by the regulators 
into this industry because if anybody knows how to navigate regulation and compliance, it's big tobacco, right? I mean, they, that's what they do. That's all they do. So um, anyway, we'll, we'll get to that. And, and I, I think, Kevin, I, I'd be curious because you started talking about wellness. We, we're talking about pharma. We're talking about, uh, you know, essentially recreational. So there's all these sub-verticals that a big integrated company like Acreage could, could operate in. And frankly, you're... Okay, so w w let's get to that because I think it's, it's related to a follow-up question on this. And, and in fact, um, I would just say, as you see the places you can have the most impact, let's, let's start with that. And, and, and if you want to layer in criminal justice, um, but I think there's, there are three or four very clear avenues and areas of growth for your company. Um, answer that as you will. As, what, what gets you as, most excited? Well, as we set out to be in this business many, many years ago, the path um, was frankly unclear. It was essentially be involved with a, a growing and an emerging business, create the raw materials around the industry, and then see where uh, the chips fall. Today, it's as much of us being proactive going out and pursuing um, a lot of these different lanes as it is being dictated to us by all of the big industries that you've mentioned. So uh, make no mistake about it, whether we in the U.S. are welcoming big alcohol, um, the Canadians have welcomed Constellation. Um, the Canadians have welcomed Altria. The Canadians have welcomed big pharma. And the day the States Act takes place, it moves right into the U.S., whether people in the U.S. like it or not. But as it relates to social justice, I am a huge believer that people in this uh, industry need to be recognized. But I'll also tell you, part of the heartache that I experience on a daily basis is the fact that we have built a robust, wonderful business, and 15% of the jailed and prison population here in the United States, 15% of incarceration is due to a cannabis-related offense. And again, my view is I can't rewrite history, and I had nothing to do with jailing anyone. But what I can tell you is we advocate for Look, look, hold on a second, hold on a second. Um, let, let's, let's, let's stay on topic here, which is that um, there's a criminal justice issue, which I think actually, Speaker Boehner, I'd like to hear from you who have spent a good part of your career focused on I, this I've, issue. I've, this is, uh, look, your passion is important, and, it's, and it's, it's a critical part of this issue because the criminality around it has been, has been entirely hypocritical and unfair. So long, let's talk long about Long before this. I've ever given any thought to cannabis, uh, going back at least the last 10 or 15 year, years, uh, I've been for criminal justice reform. I worked with members on both sides of the aisle, uh, at which, which resulted uh, in a bill that passed uh, finally uh, late last year dealing with federal crimes. Uh, and I think that the 33 states uh, who uh, have approved the use of cannabis in their states need to look at themselves and those 33 <clears throat> states uh, and deal uh, with, with people uh, who were incarcerated under one regime, under other opinions a long time ago, uh, and now these states have clearly moved. And I think uh, they need to go back and take a look at this because Frankly, I don't think it's fair. I don't think we ought to have people in jails or prisons that are not uh, a risk to society. And, uh, and I don't see these people as a risk to society. No, in fact, um, you know, clearly what we're seeing is, if anything, again, the criminal justice system has been incented to see people remain, to see this stay as a Schedule I. Is, have you, you know, can you see, have you seen tangible evidence of that type of lobbying? Um, and, and is it changing? And is there, you know, to what extent is Washington responding to, again, these, these, these mixed messages that we're getting from society? They're well, wrong. not from society, but from, from big business meeting up with society. Well, there were a lot of people who came and talked to me about criminal justice reform over the last 25 years. That's one of the reasons why I got involved in the issue. Uh, people from all across the political spectrum 
uh, but uh, were, were engaged in this issue that helped educate me. And, uh, and I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I was never on the Judiciary Committee, uh, but uh, it seemed unfair to me. And that's why uh, I actively worked with members on both sides of the political aisle uh, to advance to this issue. But remember, most of the people who were incarcerated uh, for the uh, improper use of this, uh, of, of cannabis, are, have been incarcerated under state or local laws, mm -hmm. not federal law. There, there's, and I think, uh, I'm not sure exactly what happened in the federal uh, civil or the, the criminal justice reform bill that Congress passed at the end of the last year, but uh, I've got to believe it would dealt with anybody on the federal level uh, convicted of, of cannabis issues. Isn't it safe to say that, that this issue, in the same way that perceptions in our country have changed, it seems like almost overnight, but, but you know, I realize this has taken a long time, but certainly in the last couple of years, and it's part of the reason why I brought up that I remember where I was when, when I heard about your appointment to the Acreage Board, because to me, it just seems like, um, frankly, I, I think you've been important in helping to change perception for people to think about this and think about how they're dealing with the full spectrum of issues. Is it fair, Kevin, to say that, that whether it's you, me, or everybody in this room, is thinking about this as an issue socially differently than you did 10 years ago. Um, and, and that part of this is education, part of this is enlightenment, part of this is really uh, us all working through the issues, because let's face it, we were geared for a long time. Uh, you know, I smoked pot in high school, um, really did, stopped doing it because I, 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 wasn't really, I wasn't really enjoying the buzz. Um, but, but the reality is that, um, you know, I grew up in a town where if I got caught smoking pot, I, I clearly wouldn't have been tossed in jail. They would have called my parents, and, and I would have been slapped on the wrist and, and, and put back into school. Um, I never thought about these issues in the same way I do now, and I think it's fair to say that society is thinking about things differently. And I think that's, that should be applauded. I don't know that people should be vilified for, for the perceptions of yesterday. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, I, for one, um, was a naysayer before I had gotten involved. Um, and as you've pointed out, um, uh, Speaker Boehner uh, had a different view. Um, but when someone has the courage to change their mind and someone puts it forth, and ultimately for the betterment of everyone in this room, that's really what we're trying to focus on. Yes, we started the National Cannabis Roundtable for one reason and one reason only. So we could spend our own money that we've actually earned in this business to ultimately go down and, and work with both the House and the Senate in Washington to advocate for everyone in this room to have a choice. And as people evolve over a period of time, people have the opportunity to change their mind. You know, who would have thought 30 years ago that gay marriage would be accepted, and today it's not even a conversation. We believe that this cannabis movement is lockstep with those views, and at the end of the day, give people a choice, and that's all we advocate for, period, end of story. So I appreciate your passion uh, about, frankly, past views, um, and I appreciate it wholeheartedly because I personally was a naysayer. So part of the change, I think, is also people, uh, it, we'll get, we're going to have time for more criminal justice discussions, but there is some element of the reason that this is cannabis for the masses on some level. So uh, I think that's part of why the perception is changing. And, and I want to get into this um, for the same reasons that I think Procter & Gamble wants to get into this. This is, a, this is a product, this is a consumption product, and it could take a lot of different forms. It could be wellness, it could be medical, it could be biopharma, um, it could be recreational. And then there's a whole lot of uh, friction in the industry that is supporting all of these areas. How are you guys approaching building brands? And how are you approaching marketing? Because you know, ultimately, this is a product, and, and I'm curious how you approach a very, marketing is a complex issue, you gotta get it right, uh, and, and I'm trying to understand how you're addressing Acreage as a consumer products company. Today we're in 19 states, 
and we have the raw materials um, of this business to be in front of more than 200 million Americans in the United States. We're in, our footprint expands uh, to where 80% of all cannabis users, we have an opportunity to serve. So it's the raw materials of, 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 the, of, of what we brought to the table, coupled that with um, an acquisition that we had done uh, not too long ago called the Form Factory. Mm -hmm. And this is a company that gives us the ability to uh, co-pack and really afford um, not only ourselves and our internal brands to be produced um, CPG style and, 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 and FDA uh, compliant, but we also offer other brands that would like to be um, put through our pipes. Let's talk about social issues. This is a very difficult business given the egregious tax code, given the uh, federal uh, headwinds, given the fact that you have to manage you know, hundreds of employees to turn a profit. It's very capital intensive and, and very expensive. And unfortunately, not everyone is afforded the opportunity to be in the business. But what we can do is encourage everyone in the space to come up with innovative, interesting brand ideas or delivery uh, ideas and come to us with your thinking and we can essentially take your thoughts and do a partnership where we can put your brands on our rails and frankly um, spread the enthusiasm and the wealth in the business. But at the end of the day, um, we're not big corporate America. You know, myself and, and my wife started in this business many years ago, just like everyone else has the opportunity to. We were able to capitalize on a movement that I believe right. had great prospects, but that's where we are today. Well, and, and the, maybe the ultimate uh, landing spot for any company that's establishing a brand is a commercial uh, during the Super Bowl, where <laughs> this has become more about the analysis of, of, uh, uh, of these advertisements than it is about the game sometimes. So um, I'd actually like to bring up this issue as it relates to the PSA that Acreage uh, was willing to cut a $5 million check to do, in fact, had it teed up, but was denied by CBS. This, this PSA received a ton of attention. And, and, and why do you think that is? I mean, it, it, and, and what do you think the, the response well, has been? Well, it received a lot of attention because the CBS and or NFL decided they weren't going to have this as part of uh, the Super Bowl package. Uh, I don't know how many other ads got rejected, but uh, probably not very many. And uh, so it like, gets rejected. Everybody wants to know, well, what is it? And so what, it's a normal human reaction. People go find it and, and, and take a look at it. And so there have been a lot of hits. And uh, frankly, it's worked out pretty well. Kevin, I mean, you know, what, what are your comments? You've answered this question so many times now since then, but, but really, um, forget how tactical that now looks like in hindsight. It wasn't the intent. <clears throat> well, it was not the intent, um, but I will say statistically it was a very good outcome. The Super Bowl has about 100 million viewers, and days after this ad was released, we had over 2 billion impressions. And the reason we had 2 billion impressions is because people care about cannabis and people care about helping others. This is not about our dispensaries and our nifty botanist brand. It has nothing to do with our product offerings. It has nothing to do with our capabilities or, or, or what we can grow a gram of cannabis for. It has everything to do with a veteran and a child with epilepsy and uh, someone who had been addicted to opiates and had found cannabis as not a, a gateway drug, but an exit drug. Now, yes, we were willing to spend that money. And the fact that we were willing to spend that money <laughs> is simply because, back to the idea that we are an economic leader, but we strive to be a social leader as well. It's very hard to watch that ad, and it's very hard to be composed because these are real people that we actually know, and these are real people that are actually patients of ours. And from our vantage point, the hypocrisy that is still a Schedule One drug 
Yet, don't try to convince the parents of that child that it has no medicinal value going from 70 seizures a day to one a month. And our view is very, very clear and very, very straightforward. It's our responsibility, whether we believed historically whether it should have been or not, today we do. And again, we're not gonna rewrite history, but we're gonna basically create a future where people can receive compassionate care through cannabis. End of story. Well, yeah. and that's just it. No, I, I, think, I think that's important. And, and I, unfortunately, there's this circular dynamic here where we wouldn't know about that. I mean, yes, there's the illicit market and there was the illicit, there was people been medicating themselves for years with cannabis. But the reality is that there are so many people suffering out there uh, and the ability of legislation to allow us to really understand. I, my, I am sure that the awareness in our country um, of how people are being helped every day by cannabis is changing everybody's mind. And well, to, to add to the thought, we have a veteran that works with us. We have made a point to hire many, many veterans because this job in cannabis is a perfect fit for them. They're in the field, they're active, and it's a young person's game given the velocity of which it's growing. In one particular case, we have a gentleman that graduated from West Point and spent 11 years of active duty in the United States Army. He spent three years of his life away from his family and his children over in Iraq defending this country. Three years of his life he dedicated to fight for his and, and our rights. But he doesn't have the, the opportunity to choose cannabis, and all the VA really wants to do is fill an opiate prescription. Well, West Point found out that he was working for Acreage, and they so, said to him, now that we know you're working for a cannabis company, we're taking away your pension. True story. And from our vantage point, and they even gave him the option to say, if you quit the company, you can actually get your pension back. And he said, I've stood by this country for 11 years. Keep the pension, because I have found a home with this organization, not only advocating for myself and my family, but for the 23 million veterans. So again, I love your passion. I love the passion of this employee. And all we're striving to do is have five to 600 of the same type of mindset come and work with us to move this forward. We're all in it together, make no mistake about it. And at the end of the day, that is why we're in this business today. There's another question here, um, really poignant stuff, Kevin. And, and so Speaker Boehner, question is, if you had introduced legislation to legalize cannabis while Speaker, do you think it would have passed? No. What's different about our country today? Public opinion has changed pretty rapidly. Uh, three and a half years ago, when I was still speaker, I don't know what the number of states were that had approved it, but it probably was half of, uh, of what it is today. And so uh, it wouldn't have passed uh, uh, five years ago, no way, shape, or form. Is there one side of the aisle that you think could have been the blame for that? In other words, it, was this, is, it's now a bipartisan Well, issue. you know, Republicans uh, uh, more or less been opposed to cannabis as opposed to Democrats. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, but you find a lot of Republicans uh, who are become, becoming a little bit more libertarian uh, right. who really don't care. And so uh, uh, if, if views are changing, uh, you'd see it mostly on the Republican side. We're running out of time here, folks, and, and I want to get to a couple of questions, although, frankly, it, trust me, we've gotten through a lot of them. I'm sure there are a couple. I just want to talk about the investment side of this, Kevin, because there's a lot of people out there. This is not an investment panel, um, but investing in the sector is something that people also are passionate about and excited about and concerned about because, uh, frankly, asset prices don't necessarily reflect uh, where these companies are in terms of their their business cycle right now, but your company is a great example of a company that's executing, you said, numbers out a couple days ago. Uh, market rewarded those numbers. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it's a scary time to be investing. What should investors be looking for from companies? And, and you like to say uh, it's more important to, to 
you know, find a good jockey than a good horse. Um, I, I like to say I, I'd rather inv invest in an A-plus management team with a B idea. Um, I think you know where we're going with this, but I you do. tell me. And I'll put my investment hat on, um, given the fact that I'm, I'm a re reformed hedge fund manager. So I've seen the light, and I've, I've left that business, and I'm now a, a gondrepreneur. But going I'm on a back, financial market show every single day, so I'm a bad guy. <laughs> but um, sorry, keep going. But thinking about the opportunity and the investment itself, there's a couple of different ways to make money. Um, one, just playing the overall market movement, uh, which would be a, a, a beta trade. So you want to be in a sector that ultimately is growing and that you can be a part of. And, and really, the, 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 the returns that you'll see in cannabis go forward will really come full circle when this country passes legislation that gives more clarity so companies like ours can list on New York Stock Exchange and there's a lot more of a buying base for the industry itself. So, you know, buying just a basket of cannabis stocks, playing the States Act is probably a prudent way of thinking about it. And then going specifically to the jockey and the horse, it's the reason why we have put together a world-class executive team, hired passionate people to come and work and partner with us, couple that with what we believe to be a world-class board of directors, we're trying to set ourselves apart as it relates to the rest of the pack. And I think that's probably a good reason uh, that's led to us being in 19 states and an industry leader. Going back to 2011, the investment was very easy. Do what everyone else is not doing and be right. And I think we were able to see that back in 2011. It's gotten more competitive today than ever with all of the big industries getting involved. And I'm just proud to be a part of the organization. This is not about Kevin Murphy or anyone else in our, our organization. We're in it together, and it's our goal to essentially change the way people perceive this plant and this will be the legacy um, that I'd like to be remembered for. The, the, another one of those moments I remember where I was when I heard this news is, is when I heard that Constellation Brands, which is one of the largest big alcohol and beverage and spirits companies, decided they were going to take a majority stake, or at least have the option after taking a 38% stake, and the option to take it to a majority of controlling stake in, in, Canada's, in Canada's Canopy Growth Company. Um, arguably the leader in Canada, um, one of the big global alcohol companies says, we want to be in this industry. So I, I put it to you, Speaker Boehner. Um, again, as a guy that has seen this in other parts of the world and other emerging markets, when the multinationals come in and say, we want to be there, it drives valuations through the roof. Okay. Um, and less about what stocks are worth, but what do you think is the most uh, interesting investment angle here for multinationals. And, and, and to the extent that you want to talk about it, who, who's, who's knocking at the door? What, what industries, you know, we've been around this, but it seems to me like these are the guys that are going to dictate the next move. You've got industries that are looking for ways to grow uh, who are shrinking today. And long term, that's not good uh, for their investors, not good for their stock, and they're looking uh, for ways to grow their company. Uh, whether it's big alcohol, big tobacco, uh, big pharma, uh, soft drink companies. There's a, there, there are a lot of people at food companies, the dog food people, there are a lot of people looking for ways to grow. <laughs> uh, but you know, I look at this, you know, I'm not a professional investor, all right? Uh, I've invested over the years. Uh, but when I look at what's happening in the cannabis industry, we're in the very early stages. Yep. Yes, Kevin's been around this uh, for eight years and uh, buying up assets and building this company. Uh, but uh, when you look at the size of this market and what it's going to look like 10 years from now, what it's going to look like 20 years from now, uh, we're in the very, very early stages of what is going to be a huge industry. We sell about $50 billion worth of cigarettes in the United States every year. How many of those do you consume? Uh, my fair share, trust me. Just kidding. Sorry. Uh, but uh, uh, I would guess that this industry... Uh, legal industry is going to be bigger than that uh, in the next seven or eight years. 
I think you're right. Um, and Kevin, I'm going to ask you a question, and you can start the answer by telling me what you think the size of this market is now, globally, um, and where you think it's going to be in five years. But the last question, we really have time for them. Sorry, but I, I want to get to this because I think there's a lot of people in the room that are either attached to the industry or attracted to the industry as entrepreneurs and maybe have been involved as entrepreneurs. So the question is, what is your advice to cannabis entrepreneurs and advocates that have gotten the industry, that have gotten the industry to the point that you can benefit? Um, words of wisdom, too, to, to, to Words of wisdom. Move forward I, I, I would space. say that um, having been in the money management business many, many years ago, I was very, very fortunate to convince a very large partner, XL Reinsurance, to partner with me. And someone once said to me, Murph, if you want to make a lot of money, find a really, really rich partner. <laughs> so I did. Right. And um, that overlays to maybe some of the advice that I would give entrepreneurs. Come up with great ideas, and if you have the resources and the capital to implement it, do it. There's no greater privilege than to be um, on your own, working for yourself. If you don't have the money to do it, come up with the same wonderful idea, the same great delivery mechanism, and bring it to us, because we'll be a kingmaker for you. And again, we've done it a number of times. We encourage folks to, to, to come and, and, and be a part of it. But at the end of the day, and I wanted to give a, a real live example as to where you had asked me on the investment side, yeah. I believe this is going very, very simply Illinois, New Jersey, New York, and Massachusetts, four states, are larger than all of Canada. Yet the Canadian companies, and, and Bruce, if you're out there, kudos to you, awesome job. He has a $15 billion market cap in Canada, which is smaller than those four states, but he smartly has now a monstrous balance sheet to come and, and reappropriate that capital to the U.S. and make no mistake about it, that he will and, and everyone else, other, all the other Canadians will as well. So I think this wave is really moving in the favor of, you know, up and to the right. And again, combine that with all the social issues that we're looking to tackle, there's no greater privilege than to be in this business today. Great. Well, I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time and, and certainly it's a, it's a it's a thrill. It's, it's important to be at an event like this. So congratulations to South by Southwest for continuing to bring this type of thought leadership to the world, frankly. Um, and, and a topic and a breakout cannabis this year has occupied the, the right spot uh, because of where it is right now. So um, Kevin Murphy, Speaker Boehner, congratulations. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.